You know, um, yeah, Stan Lee in many ways changed my life. Uh, I went through, I, I read comic books when I was quite young, uh, more than I actually read book books. I mean, uh, we, we learned to read in, in school, of course. I was always a good student. And I learned to read as uh, kids of my generation did, baby boomers, uh, from what they called readers. And these readers that you got in school featured the adventures of Dick and Jane and their little sister Sally and a dog named Spot who lived in some suburb that was utterly unrecognizable to me to living in the, in the streets of Bayonne, New Jersey in the projects. And uh, this was the dullest family in human history. <laughs> I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to read books if this was what books were like. You know, there was old Sea Spot Run, Run Spot Run, and Dick and Jane with a red boat and a blue boat sailing it on a pond. I mean, it was just tedious crap. And uh, <laughs> but meanwhile, there were comic books, and comic books were much cooler. I mean, there, there was Superman, and there was Batman, and, and uh, there were the Black Hawks and the Challengers of the Unknown. It was all DC when I was very young, so I, I had all these comic books. Uh, and then one time uh, for my birthday, uh, a friend of my mother's gave me a copy, hard book, Scribner's book, Robert A. Heinlein, Half Space Open Travel, and. Hey, it doesn't have to be Dick and Jane. It can be, you know, the worm faces and the mother things and, and a spacesuit and sailing to other planets. This is great stuff. So I, I kind of, uh, I had an allowance and I could get a certain amount of comic books for it, but I, I made the difficult and painful decision to stop buying so many comic books and to buy book books instead. I, it was a decade before I got another hardcover book. So my collection in those days consisted of one hardcover book and then a lot of uh, ace doubles and 25 and 35 cent paperbacks that I got from Spinner Rack, which was right next. And I, I stopped buying comics. In fact, I gave my early comics away because I was now grown up and too old for, for comic books. I was reading real books now. And I love the real books, but you know, that Spinner Rack was right next to the comic book rack. And one day after a couple years of not reading comic books, I saw this strange looking comic book. It wasn't from National Periodical Publications. And it had these four four guys on it, Fantastic Four. It said, World's Greatest Comic Magazine, which seemed like a, quite a boast for, for that comic magazine that I'd never heard of. And it didn't include either Superman or Batman or any of the big names. But, you know, there was a guy on fire on the cover and there was a, like a monster. And then one of the team was a monster. Nobody ever had a monster as part of the team. If you were ugly, you were a bad guy. That was the rules of DC. <laughs> Could be an ugly good guy. I mean, it was just breaking all the rules. But I, it was Fantastic Four number four, and I bought it, and it was amazing. And then it got me, it sucked me right into comics. So I was right there at the beginning of uh, um, what would later be called the Marvel Age. Uh, so I was able to get the first issue of Avengers and X Men and Amazing Fantasy 15 and the introduction of Spider Man, and all written by this guy, Stan Lee. And uh, it, it you know, not only did it get me back into comics, but it really changed my life because one of the things I started doing was writing letters to the editors of these magazines, and uh, they published. Stan published one of my letters in Fantastic Four number 20. Um, I wonder why he published it. It said, hmm, Shakespeare move over, Stan Lee has arrived. Maybe that was the reason. <laughs> I compared, uh, I compared Stan favorably to Shakespeare. Uh, so it was a somewhat immoderate uh, letter. Um, it also contained the phrase, by gumbo. Uh, I don't know why I wrote by gumbo, but uh, it's not like I said by gumbo often in my everyday speech. But, but somehow I put it in a letter, and uh, which would have been fine, except some other kids from school saw it. And then for like a year and a half, I was tormented with the phrase, by gumbo. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere I turned, people would see me and uh, you know, they'd shout out, George, by gumbo. <laughs> um, but in those days when they printed your, your letter of comment in a, in a comic book, they printed your full address. And I started getting comic fanzines and letters from other comic fans. And uh, you know, comic fanzines were these amateur, magazines published by uh, 
on Mimigraph or a, a process named called Ditto, which involved training of gelatin and, and uh, other things. And I think they could produce like 13 copies before the Ditto Master Pro, all, all in this purple type. I don't know why it all came in purple, but it was always purple and fading even as you read it. Um, <laughs> and some of, some of the fanzine contents was discussion of the latest issue of Fantastic Four or Justice Lake, you know, fan articles, critical articles, and fan art, which was often pretty bad, but sometimes not bad. Um, and a few of them also published amateur stories, amateur superhero stories. And I read those and I said the, the words that I think all writers eventually at some point in their life need to say, which is when you read something that's not great and you say, hey, I could do better than that. <laughs> so I started writing amateur superhero stories and sending them to the fanzines and they started publishing them and, uh, and people liked them and that encouraged me to do more and, uh, and suddenly I was a writer. <laughs> Do you, do you have any of the copies of those old fancies? I do. I'm a pack rat. I have everything. <laughs> not, only, not only that, there are people in this crowd who have them because I, I signed some during the, this morning's uh, autographing, and that's that's really scary when you get. <laughs> they they sold for a quarter in those days, although in a lot of cases they gave them away. It was like a quarter or the usual. And the usual was like a letter of comment, or you traded a copy of your own fanzine, or you wrote something for them, so you could get it free. But if you paid for it, it was a quarter, which people mailed, it, it, it was going through the post, nobody, we were all high school kids and junior high school kids, nobody had a checking account, and you didn't want to write a check for a quarter anyway, so you had to scotch tape the quarter to an index card, and so they were called sticky quarters, because when you peel off the scotch tape, the, the quarter always had the residue of stickiness on it, so. I sent off a lot of sticky quarters, and uh, um, that was uh, that was the whole uh, the whole world of the fanzines. So I'm I'm seeing these fanzines here, and I'm saying, where did you get? Because the people who are showing them to me are in many cases like 20 years younger than me. Where did you get these these fanzines? And they didn't pay a quarter for it; they paid $400 on eBay. So uh, <laughs> so that proved to be a, a strangely good investment. <laughs> So let's uh, 